And see, this is the problem. Because if we're looking at, again, patterns in the last number of decades, by and large, the church has wanted to wash her hands of anything in the political sphere, anything that has to do with legislation, because that's, that's politics and church. They don't mix. Now, I don't like politics any, any more than anyone else, but government is of God. And that's what we have to pay attention to. Hey everyone, this is Wanda Alger, and today is Wednesday, April 10. Hey, I'm hoping that uh, you can catch our live stream uh, that we did this past weekend in our Unlocking Prophetic Revelation conference with Andrew Whalen. We had an amazing time. I actually heard from many of you who are watching online, as well as uh, finally being able to meet some of you in person. Uh, it was a great weekend, Friday night, all day Saturday, and then Andrew even stayed on Sunday morning and spoke. There was a lot shared, and we really feel it was a significant time, especially given the eclipse and all the hype that was around that. You know, so much prophetic uh, intel that was given and a lot that was suggested. You know, who knows what, what's going to happen? But we really even just felt in the spirit that our collective faith by gathering together as we did was really going to uh, shift some things. Uh, and I'm sure we're one of many gatherings that have also had that same heart and that same desire to really stand in the gap and pray, uh, you know, during this time. But I wanted to let you know about the live streams that are there because uh, you can still watch everything on the replay and you can find them. I'm going to show you right now on uh, our YouTube channel, Crossroads Community Church. They are right now under the live stream uh, heading. You can see them all there, Unlocking Prophetic Revelation. Uh, they are just beginning to uh, edit and shorten the videos to cut out the worship and, and just to have the, the message uh, and here's Andrew Whalen's message from Sunday morning. And then this little clip, this is what I'm going to share here in this video. It's a 10 minute clip from my Saturday morning session. Uh, Nineveh was waiting for Jonah. America is waiting for the church. This is what I'm, I'm going to talk about. Uh, but that 10 minute clip is here. So if you want to watch the, the whole conference, it's going to be there. Okay. On, on crossroads. And what I'm also going to be sharing since I'm here uh, sharing my screen is here's my website, wandaalger.me, and the blog that I'm going to share right here, you can find it as well. You click on uh, the, the blogs there, and you can find all of my articles. You can also subscribe to my newsletter, by the way, that comes out either Wednesday or Thursday every week, and it includes links to everything that I've put out that week, be it an article, a video clip, an interview, a resource, uh, it, upcoming events, all that kind of thing. So uh, I can see the subscribers, they're, they're growing every week. And I, I really appreciate that uh, because it's it's a good way to just make sure you don't miss anything as well as subscribing to these video channels. That would be great too. But what I wanted to catch you up on was uh, a word that came this weekend. I knew that the Lord wanted me to share about healing of hearts. I've been sharing it in some videos and I've released it in some words of just how much God is intent on doing some heart surgery. He, he's, he's preparing us okay, for what's coming. The days ahead, we've heard there's there's going to be some troubling times. We don't know what it's going to mean. I put out code red. That's what I heard the Lord say, that there's a, a crucible. It's all unto the baptism of the fire of God. I mean, it's all good stuff, but uh, it may not come as easy as what we'd like. So all these things the Lord is preparing us for. So in my Saturday morning session this past weekend, I was ministering uh, more into that. And we had a powerful time of ministry. Uh, and that's that's on the the online live stream. So again, please be sure and watch that. I I would hope that you're going to receive something from that. But what surprised me is that the Lord also gave me another word immediately following uh, the release of that one. And this was really a corporate word to the church. You know, there's been a lot of talk about Nineveh and Jonah with this whole eclipse thing, and you know, going through these towns, you know, supposedly called Nineveh. And I realize there's so much circulating out there. Uh, and I won't, I'm not going to go into the weeds about that. <clears throat> I think we could all agree God does use signs in the heavens to speak as a sign. Uh, interpreting it, yeah, you know, that can get kind of subjective. But I think we would all agree that God is very set against wickedness. And he sees the rampant sin. And he's wanting to address it. He has also been calling the church to rise up. 
And so this story of Jonah and Nineveh that has really come to the forefront, yeah, we can draw a lot of parallels to it, no doubt. And I'm not the first one to do it. But I had to think about it again this past weekend in comparing the church to Jonah. And the Lord just kind of highlighted some things that I wanted to, to bring uh, because we really need to prayerfully consider this, not just in listening to a word and saying, oh, wow, you know, that's wow, that's really important. God is looking for action. He is looking for the body of Christ, the ecclesia specifically, to rise up and to speak up because we have a commission just like Jonah did. And I think even the picture of Jonah and what happened to him when he didn't listen, I think is very strategic for us right now. But before I share more of this word, I just got an email this morning uh, from Daniel. I'm not going to say your last name. Daniel, if you're watching, you'll know who you are because you asked me a very good question and I wanted to answer it uh, because you said, because uh, you're wanting some clarity, okay? Because again, there's there's terminology going around about God judging America and, and what's happening in the church. So he said, uh, leading up to and shortly after the 2020 election steal, uh, the prophets were comparing America, most Americans, the American church, to Israelites in bondage in Egypt, and that many were prophesying that we were in a time of deliverance, that God's miraculous Red Sea parting deliverance was just around the corner. Well, he said, now we're being compared to godless Nineveh. So my question is, which one is it? How can we be both? Well, I don't know if I'm going to answer that question perfectly, Daniel, but here, here's my take on this. God is not coming to judge America. I believe there's there's two Americas, okay? God is coming to judge wickedness. Those who have intentionally chosen wickedness, those who have intentionally opposed him, he will judge that. But he's also crying for mercy for those who are innocent, those who are caught, those who have yet to hear the name of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom. And so the, the America that is being judged is not all of America. Because there's many Americans who are God-fearing, who have been following the word of God, who believe in the Constitution, and who believe in the foundings of this nation, and those God-fearing men and women who started things, that's the America that God wants to restore. We know that there's another version of America that's been hijacked, robbed, pillaged, is being destroyed. But God sees the original seed of America that he's wanting to save. In like manner, I believe there's two churches. I believe that there is a man-centered, man-made church, religion, that God's coming to destroy. And it's really the ecclesia, the true governing body of Christ, that God is calling to rise up. So there's spiritual realities. There's natural implications. In answer to your question, I see Nineveh. It is Nineveh. It, it was an evil city. It, it was overtaken by sin, by wickedness, rulers in high places, obviously. But yet God's call was, there are still many innocent within that city. That's why he was crying for mercy. He was calling for time. He needed more time to reach them, which I believe is, is what he's doing now. So I hope that kind of uh, clarifies you know, what we're talking about. I personally don't ever <clears throat> say God's coming to judge America because that's, it's, he's not. You can't just put everyone in the same uh, same basket, <clears throat> but he is coming to judge wickedness. Now, in terms of what the Lord highlighted to me, <clears throat> I, I titled it, Nineveh was waiting on Jonah. America is waiting on the church. And the scripture that uh, first caught me in the book of Jonah, very short book telling this story, Jonah 1.6, but Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him. You know, Jonah is a picture of the church, the sleeping church. And it was the captain of this ship that says to Jonah, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And in that verse, I heard America calling to the church. Where are you? Where are you? Those who claim to fear God and know God. Something's not right. Jonah fell asleep. And I feel that there are many in the church who have fallen asleep. Now, again, not everybody. There is a remnant that has risen up, that is, has awoken up, 
and is trying to sound the alarm to the rest of the sleeping church. But I believe it's the sleeping church that God's trying to get the attention of, just like Jonah. Now, understand when I'm talking about the ecclesia, very key scripture here, because if we're going to think about what our commission is, and even, you know, God called Jonah to go to Nineveh and actually to speak against the wickedness. That was the call. Go and prophesy, speak to the wickedness and call them to repent, that they would know exactly what they're doing and that there's consequences to it. But in terms of the ecclesia, we get this from Matthew 16, verses 18 to 19. When Jesus spoke to Peter, he said, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. And that word is actually translated ecclesia. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, it's the ecclesia that the gates of hell shall not prevail against. Now, in that day, the disciples knew exactly what Jesus was talking about because he used the word ecclesia, not, the ch not church. That wasn't even the, the term. Ecclesia. The ecclesia was known to be uh, a Roman practice of uh, people being assigned by Rome to go to different regions and so transform them to look like Rome. That They were governing. They were given authority, jurisdiction to go to these different places to totally change that region to look like Rome. This was God's charge. This is what the ecclesia was supposed to be, a governing body of believers who had legitimate authority to go and to replicate the kingdom of God. That was the charge. And so this is what Jesus was telling Peter. I'm, I'm building the ecclesia. And then he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So right here from the very beginning, it says it all starts in prayer. This is a spiritual war. First and foremost, you are not fighting flesh and blood. You are fighting powers and principalities. And you have the jurisdiction to do it. Okay, so this is the context that, that we have to, have to look at. But when I'm, when I'm suggesting here that the church has fallen asleep, I, I'm, I'm not saying everybody. Again, there's, there's a remnant that has awoken up and there is the, the emerging of the ecclesia, those who carry this heart and they understand it, they have this vision. But I'm talking about a part of the church that refuses to acknowledge the problems. They don't want to deal with things. They don't want to deal with things in the nation. They're, they're frustrated. They're bitter. They're upset. Some just have a pity party because that's really what, I mean, if you get the picture of it, he goes, you know, crawls down on the corner of the bottom of the ship and just wants to go to sleep. See, he was mad at God. He didn't like, he didn't like that God wanted to spare Nineveh. He wanted to see it all destroyed. And so he just goes and, and decides, I'm not going to deal with it. He tries to wash his hands of responsibility. And see, this is the problem. Because if we're looking at, again, patterns in the last number of decades, by and large, the church has wanted to wash her hands of anything in the political sphere, anything that has to do with legislation, because that's, that's politics and church. They don't mix. Now, I don't like politics any, any more than anyone else, but government is of God. And that's what we have to pay attention to. Politics, yeah, that gets messy. But God has always wanted us to demonstrate the kingdom of God, which is his government. That's why the government rests on his shoulders. We need to know healthy government. And uh, sin is being, uh, is being legislated, by the way. Years ago, that was an argument. Uh, it's obvious. <laughs> Those who are in power and ruling, they are legislating morality. They are legislating faith. This is what the God has been trying to wake up the church to. You'd better get engaged. You need to take some ownership in this, okay? And so here again, when I look at, at the story of Jonah, even the captain and the crew realized this storm is not right. They call out to their gods. There's no answer. And they finally whittle it down through Lot in realizing that Jonah is the problem. Well, he's the man of God. And so they assume you're supposed to know what's going on. Speak to your God. And, and I really feel like this is probably the heart of a very frustrated nation that they don't put it in words. <laughs> yeah, the church might be mocked, but yet they know who has jurisdiction. They know who should have authority. It's the church. And certainly that's what they, 
But the captain and crew, they came and they confronted Jonah with it. And Jonah, what struck me was that what was even worse than his apathy was his own confession about the storm. Because he says in Jonah 1.12, I mean, he was so frustrated. He didn't want to deal with it. He would rather die. He told him, just pick me up and throw me overboard. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Well, think about that. He actually took responsibility. He knew that it, it was his disobedience to God that brought the storm anyway. Is this a reality check for us, church? That the storms, the global storms, all that has transpired that we have not been looking at, not paying attention to, is really a result of our apathy, our lack of involvement, our unwillingness to do what God's called us to do. I would like to suggest it is. We can't shrink back from these things anymore. And God's going to do whatever it takes to get our attention. So obviously, in the story of Jonah, it says God appointed a great fish to take him down into deep waters for a while, knowing that that's the only thing that was going to wake him up. And I suggest, is there an appointed whale-sized crisis that God has in mind for us? What's it going to take? to wake us up out of our slumber, that, that we'll answer the call, that, we're, that we will actually be those that he's called us to be in this nation? Is it going to take a couple of days in darkness? I mean, Jonah had to deal with his stubbornness and pride. He finally had to relent and say, you know, because he realized finally he could not do anything. Oh, he thought he could run, which, by the way, even in the story I hadn't noticed before in Jonah 1.3, when Jonah was running, it said, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with him to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. That's very telling. What was it in the presence of the Lord that Jonah didn't want to face? It was the fear of the Lord. I mean, the presence of the Lord is what, what fueled his life and purpose. Now, Jonah knew he, if, he, if he would be in the presence of God, he knew he would have to lay down his offenses, his bitterness, you know, whatever it was of his own issues, and, and, and he would be compelled to do what God called him to do. So he ran from it. So what used to fuel his purpose now fueled a storm. And God's storm wasn't going to stop until Jonah responded. And I would suggest that that's what we're walking through. Not necessarily the remnant, those who are awake, but, but the sleeping church. And, and I would even say that probably the church that is asleep, again, it's the man-made version. It, it's probably the version that doesn't even carry any authority to change anything because we, we've forgotten who we are. And this was actually um, the Friday night message that Andrew shared uh, this last weekend was the call and the charge of the ecclesia. You need to watch it because we have to remember who we are, what we've been given, what we carry. I, I mean, the fact is we have been given the legal authority, the jurisdiction to change things. Political leaders can't do that. Governments can't do that. Only the church of the living God can do that. I mean, you can have all kinds of programs. You can have good political leaders. And certainly we need good leaders in our governmental sphere. But it's believers in Christ that have been given the spiritual authority in the heavens. That, that's what Jesus said in Matthew. We're the only ones. And he's trying to get our attention. Because some of these storms are sent by the Lord. Oh, yeah, the enemy wants to stir up his own storm. But it was very clear. I mean, just read Jonah again. God was the one that sent the whirlwind. He's like, okay, you don't want to listen? All right, are you ready to go down deep? You want to be in the dark for a while? You're going to have to deal with things. I mean, you know, you, you, go, you go through the whole story, even when Jonah does finally go and speak what God tells him to speak, he's still, he's still got a pity party. You know, he goes up on the hill and, you know, just watches what God's going to do, mad, to the point where God actually asks him two times, are you happy being angry? I mean, like, get over yourself. <laughs> and 
And again, I had to think, I mean, let's just make it practical. As Christians, what causes us to shrink back and not to do what God wants to do? We don't want to deal with our issues. We, we get critical. We get resentful. We don't like how God does things. We think he's not doing the right thing. And that's because we've not been in the presence of the Lord. I mean, that's a whole message in itself. To, and, and this is part, I believe, of what God is bringing us into is, is another reminder of the power of his presence. I mean, tangible presence. I, he's omnipresent, but I'm talking about the tangible manifest presence, the glory of God. This is what he's preparing us for because this, this is the only place that we can get that fuel to be who we're called to be. We can't do this on our own. And even on Saturday morning, when I, when I released this word, I knew that I could not release this word until I first ministered to the healing of hearts. All the walls that we've built around ourselves, whereby we justify inaction, we justify our, our own pity, our, our own self-absorption, whatever it is. And, and the Lord says, you got to get free of yourself. You, you need to remove those walls of self-protection, all the walls that you've put up against me. Because God wants to minister his heart to a dying world. They need to de see a tangible, physical manifestation of God's love and his mercy. And I also pointed out here how the book of Jonah ended, which you really kind of have to laugh at. I mean, it's almost like a mic drop. Because after all this description of what God had taken Jonah through, you know, and Jonah having this pity party, says, the Lord said, Jonah, you know, you pity this plant because God sent a plant to shade him, you know, of this hot sun during the day. But because Jonah didn't change his attitude, the next day God appointed a worm to come and eat up the lamp, uh, the, the plant. And then I think an, a wind. The Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. What was God talking about? Why would he have pity on Nineveh, a city known for its wickedness? Because of the 120,000 persons, children. That's what many commentators uh, uh, feel that that is representing. It says persons who don't know their right hand from their left, they're innocent. They, they don't understand what's going on. They don't see the giants in the land. They, they have no idea. Those are the ones. We need more time to reach them. That's who I'm having mercy on. They're caught. They're trapped. They need a way out. And also much cattle. This is the call of the Lord. And, you know, as I shared this weekend, I don't know, you know, what the days ahead hold, but there's been plenty of warnings that it's going to be kind of a rough ride. Could it be that this is a picture of where the church is headed because of God's great love and mercy for us? And he wants us to fulfill our commission as the ecclesia. He will do whatever it takes for us to relent, for us to listen, to obey and say, yes, Lord, I will speak up. And I think this is the part of prayer. And this is why I, I would ask you to even read this word, take it to your small group, to your fellowship. Um, you need to pray into it. We need to ask the Lord, what would you have us do in our city, in our community? Okay, you don't, may not have to speak to the whole nation, but, but what about right where you live? What is the word that God wants you to speak? What are those truths that you need to share? Where are those places that you need to stand in, in the gap and cry out for mercy? It's time of action. And even when Jonah was in the belly of the whale, he interceded. He didn't just sit there. He worshiped God. He had a God encounter. He got in God's presence because that's where we're going to get our instructions. So that's my admonition as I share this with you is to spend some time in the Lord's presence and ask him, Lord, what, what would you have me do? What would you have me speak? What is the truth that, that I need to share? Am I being a, a valid ambassador of the kingdom that knows true from false, that I know light from dark and that I can speak that in such a way that will compel people to come into the kingdom to make that choice. So that's the word that I wanted to share. As I said, it is on my blog, uh, wandaeldrew.me. You can get it. And I did share uh, this word. You can catch the 10-minute video clip there on uh, the YouTube channel as well. 
and watch that, maybe even share it uh, just to consider, uh, because I did pray for everyone there at the end as well. So the other thing that I wanted to let you know is uh, this is April uh, 10, 11, 10. Today is the 10th. And in less than two weeks, I'm going to be in Waterloo, Iowa. And if you are around there, I'm going to be going uh, to the Crossroads Assembly of God Church there in Waterloo, an all-day conference on Saturday and then ministering Sunday morning. Uh, they have here uh, registration information. This is on my website, wandaalger.me. So if you are around Waterloo, uh, Iowa, uh, I think there's still time that you can come in or even be a part of their Sunday service. I'm also going to be in Houston, Texas here at the beginning of next month, May. Uh, again, all these uh, events that are upcoming, you can find on my events page at wandaalger.me. So with that, leave your comments below and let me know uh, what is your take on uh, what happened Monday, April 8 in the eclipse? Have you had any revelations since then? Has anything become clear? You know, we're all continuing to, to pray and to ask the Lord we, what he would have us to do. I think he has been preparing us uh, for whatever that might look like. But go ahead and leave your comments, uh, your encouragements for everyone. And we will see you next time. Blessings.